um, we're going to have quite a packed day, so um, I'm glad that we can get going. We start off with um, yet another welcome. I know we had several of them yesterday, but this is from uh, Julio Frank, who, as you heard, was the dean of this, uh, our school, the Harvard Chan School of Public Health, when uh, we first launched the idea of this conference. And he was very, uh, very much uh, not only a supporter, but was actually involved in some of our early discussions. And so he, he I think his background as, as formerly as, as Minister of Health in, in Mexico gave him a real understanding of the critical importance of the issues that we're addressing. And so he, he brought to bear some of that expertise and, and uh, insight into, into our early discussions. Unfortunately, he, he has left Harvard to go and be the president of the University of Miami. But before leaving, he um, said that he definitely wanted to be a virtual part of the conference, and we were very pleased about that. So what we're going to do is start today off with a brief video uh, address from him. So um, this is uh, former Dean Julio Frank um, addressing us. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Since this is a conference on national identification, I thought I would start by identifying myself. My name is Julio Frank, and until August of 2015, I served for almost seven years as the dean of the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Since then, I have moved on to become the president of the University of Miami. But because I was heavily involved with the conception and initial planning stages of this conference, the organizers have kindly invited me to uh, give some welcoming remarks to all of you. And I am indeed most delighted and honored to welcome you to this very important conference on national identification, a topic that addresses a critical set of issues for a school of public health to explore. I regret that I am not able to join you in person, given my new responsibilities, but I look forward to the outcome of what I am sure will be a dynamic and impactful discussion. Uh, for a research institution such as the Harvard Chan School that is committed to the production and dissemination of knowledge relevant to health and well-being, the issue of civil identification is central. It impacts the enjoyment of basic rights, the development of national policy, and the deployment of service delivery systems. This conference provides an opportunity to bring globally recognized thought leaders and policymakers together to explore these issues. And as I said before, these are all issues that are central to the Harvard Chan School's drive for finding innovative approaches to improving the lives and health of people everywhere. We are truly privileged that the Chan School, the Harvard Chan School, uh, has been asked to host this very important event. As you embark on this forum for intellectual exploration and discussion, I think you will find that the issue is really one of enormous importance. Legal identification serves as the foundation for socioeconomic and political development. Proof of identity is a prerequisite of access to basic rights and services, including education, formal employment, voting, banking, and many more. It is crucial for effective government planning transparent policy making, and efficient service delivery. Nevertheless, underdocumentation poses a large challenge for developing countries. In many of these countries, only a fraction of the population is included in civil registration and identification systems. Of the roughly 1.8 billion people without a national ID or birth certificate, many are from poor and marginalized communities. As UNICEF reports, some 36% of children worldwide and 40% of children in the developing world are not registered at birth. Many global stakeholders, including national governments and international NGOs, are recognizing the need for effective policies to close the identification gap. UNICEF, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the World Bank, among other institutions, have focused efforts around improving legal identity around the world, recognizing it as an instrument to achieving development. This assertion is reflected in the development arena's push and pressure 
to include a target for universal provision of legal identity by 2030, and this is now part of the sustainable development goals. Uh, moreover, a number of developing countries are considering or already employing digital identity platforms to foster economic and social development. Thus, the event that you're participating in is really very, very appropriately timed to join and engage in the global dialogue about the next set of development goals. As a leading academic institution, the Harvard Chan School is uniquely poised to anticipate the tough questions that will arise when technology, public administration, and big data intersect in such large-scale efforts. Among other critical complex issues, the conference will explore the ID number formulation process, the use of biometric data, eligibility and voluntariness, and the data storage, as well as concerns surrounding privacy, risk of exclusion, and expense all of them dimensions of identification systems uh, that need to be grappled with as countries design those systems. The exceptional convening power of Harvard University has allowed it to draw together a broad spectrum of professionals, academics, and experts in this field. Uh, the distinguished panel of experts that have been convened for this event will explore the expansive potential uh, benefits of national identification, including identification as a tool for effective governance and development, the role of identification in improving service delivery, including social welfare, health insurance, voting, and the epidemiologic and social science research enabled by the database linkage capabilities fostered by the nationally assigned unique number of a national ID system. Along with its benefits, panelists will also explore the potential risks posed by identification numbers. This, of course, include data security and privacy safeguard concerns, costly and ineffective technology, and the potential increased risk of exclusion under a robust identification system. I am personally delighted that the Harvard Chan School is serving as the principal host, since, as I mentioned before, uh, this process started during my tenure as dean here, and I um, know that acting dean David Hunter has been pushing this forward. So it's really very nice to see this effort come to fruition. This event really touches on many, many core issues for a school concerned about building research capacity, educating the next cohort of health science leaders, and disseminating knowledge as a global public good. Thank you all for your participation in this event. I also thank our esteemed and generous colleague, Deborah Rose, for her original idea to launch this initiative, for her energetic engagement with the development of the project, and for their generous uh, wealth of resources, intellectual resources, human resources, and financial resources that she has brought to the school in order to bring this very important project to fruition. I wish you a most successful conference and look forward to the important conclusions that you will arrive at. Thank you very much for the opportunity to address you on this occasion. So could I please invite um, the participants in panel two to come and take their seats. Um, my name is Jacqueline Baba, and I'm one of the um, organizers of this event. And we have a slight change of plan. I'm actually going to chair this uh, panel uh, because uh, the person, Robert, Robert Palacios, uh, who was designated as chair, is actually wonderfully made a presentation. And so I think it'll be very interesting to hear from him. So we will actually... Um, uh, proceed in the order uh, in which the names are listed in the programs you have in front of you. So we started off yesterday with a broad overview of um, national identification uh, 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 and, and 
subnational identification. We looked at some of the big questions related to identity, to the legal underpinnings uh, for any system of identification. We looked at the relationship between private funding and private initiative on the one hand and government engagement on the other. We looked at some of the questions about uh, the relationship between older technologies of documentation, paper documentation, civil registration, uh, registry systems uh, as opposed to or in parallel with national identification. So we sort of set the scene for um, the discussion that we're going to have today. Our panel now um, goes into some more specific um, details regarding national identification systems. So as many of you in the room know, um, national identification uh, systems come in many shapes and forms. Some are card-based, some are number-based, some use both. Um, some are mandatory, some voluntary. Um, there are many different functions or applications that are embedded in uh, the, the national identification uh, tool. So using case studies and uh, the experience of our, of our esteemed panelists, we're going to look at some of the ways, some of the different ways in which uh, these systems have been developed. And we're going to start off with Robert Palacios. Robert is, um, just let me find my notes. Um, excuse me. Robert is uh, the global lead for pensions and social and the social the, for the pensions and social insurance group in the social protection and labor section of the World Bank. He's worked in the area of social protection and particularly pensions for many years. Um, between 1992 and 1994, he was a member of a research team that produced the bank's uh, influential volume, averting the old age crisis. So he's been thinking about these issues for, for several decades. Um, in parallel to his work on pensions, he also has been uh, in actively engaged in issues relating to, to national identification and has worked in several parts of the world. Um, but he now has a particular focus, I think, on African countries. So, Robert, thank you so much for joining us, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, let me begin by thanking the organizers, Jacqueline, uh, Deborah, um, Tyler, for all your support, um, and thanks for inviting us from the World Bank. Um, can we... So I, I was telling people earlier today that I started getting heavily involved in this in, in when I stayed in India between 2007 and 2010 where we worked on a health insurance program that used uh, biometric identification um, through a smart card. And in parallel, ADAR was being uh, rolled out the year after that, and I was involved in both of those projects. And that was sort of my apprenticeship in this area. Um, I then came to back to the bank from India, to Washington, that is. And we started to realize in the World Bank that we needed to have a more coherent approach on the, the subject of identification. And about a year and a half ago, uh, some of our senior management uh, set up a group that was intersectoral in nature, uh, in, in, involves about six of our global practices, as we call them. I represent social protection global practice, but there are also uh, representatives from governance and ICT and uh, finance and markets and health and gender on, on that group. And so this group tr is trying now to uh, formulate a coherent approach for the institution on the subject of identification and has made some good progress and is now starting to be active in a num number of countries in this area. Now, that being said, the World Bank was always active in the area of identification, but in very specific sort of not uh, looking at the p holistic picture of, of identification, but in certain programs that we dealt with. And some of my colleagues from the, what is now re referred to as the Identification for Development, or ID4D initiative, are here. Um, Vijanti Desai, Mia is part of that as well, has joined us recently. Um, and um, so I, I just wanted to give you a little intro as to where we're coming from uh, in that sense. So what I'm gonna talk about today is national IDs in a developing country context, in a low-income uh, country context. And I think a lot of it will kind of follow nicely from what was said yesterday, particularly from Alan Gelb's uh, presentation, and I'm going to try and go into a little more depth, and I'll try to keep it uh, in time, Jacqueline. So the first 
slide is basically what are these contextual factors that we really need to take into account in developing countries. The, the first one is a very generic thing, and we could probably you know, talk about that with, in any context, for example, delivery of cash transfers or health insurance. Your, your, your limitations in terms of infrastructure, connectivity, power supply, internet penetration, these things all affect your ability to, to do certain things, to make certain choices about how you uh, set up a program. I'm not going to talk about that because it's a very sort of generic uh, uh, contextual feature. Um, however, uh, the, the, the next three I'm going to spend some time on, and these are more specifically related to identification. The first being that historically uh, there have been either low rates of birth registration in, in these low-income countries, and in some cases, as I'll show, there, there may be uh, higher rates, but the state of those records and the state of those birth registration systems are such that it's very difficult to use them for anything uh, in terms of identification. The second one, which was brought up yesterday um, by several people, was uh, the role of electoral registries and voter IDs. And I'm going to refer to it a little more provocatively as uh, competition between the, the voter IDs and the, and the national ID systems. And then I'm going to just mention briefly uh, the, the issue of uh, personal data protection uh, in these low-income environments with a particular focus on Africa in all of these cases. So we've amassed some data. Uh, through this ID4D initiative, we have a, da a global database of ID uh, uh, indicators now, which uh, should become accessible to the public, I think, fairly soon. Um, a lot of these are, are works in progress because a lot of the data is not that easy to, to get. Um, and the last thing I'll, I'll mention on this slide is that these factors are not going to, I'm going to go into a lot of Africa uh, examples, but in fact, these apply to low-income countries in multiple regions, and in some cases to middle-income countries, what I'm going to talk about. So Africa is clearly moving to, a card, to, to national IDs and to card-based systems. So what you see here, which is using that database, is the number of countries in Africa that had uh, birth registration systems or civil registrations. That's the top blue line. Obviously, those predated uh, a lot of the national ID systems. And then you have the, this sudden dramatic rise in the number of national ID countries with national IDs uh, in the uh, 2000s. And within that group, and that's the subset, the gray line, uh, were EIDs or digital IDs. On, in the map, what you see are the countries with uh, and without uh, NIDs. Um, so the vast majority of African countries now have gone the route of having national IDs. So I think uh, Alan may have said something like this yesterday. It's not such, so much a question of whether to do it in, in, this, in this part of the world and in many low-income countries, but it's, it's how to do it well. So it's, it, the decision's been made in many countries to go ahead and, and do a national ID, uh, unlike some developed countries like my own, the United States. So the, the types of cards that are being issued uh, vary. I want to focus on, on this very colorful uh, map here, which shows uh, four categories of countries in Africa. So the red countries are the only ones with neither, uh, as far as we know, a voter ID uh, or a, a national ID, whereas the uh, purple countries have national IDs, the green countries have only voter IDs, and the orange countries have both. Um, South Africa actually should be orange at this point. Um, but what you can see is that m most countries, with a very few exceptions, have either one of these or both. So they have something. And these are, are generally, not universally, but most of these are moving towards, as you saw in the last figure, towards digital I IDs and, and more and more sophisticated types of cards. And so you see um, the types of uh, smart cards, uh, which you'd say with or without biometrics, are the green countries. And the blue countries have uh, barcodes or magnetic strip cards. Only the red countries uh, are paper IDs or, or none, none at all. Now, moving to the, the three factors I wanted to talk about, um, the low birth registration rates. Uh, so as was mentioned yesterday, uh, a number of countries have very, very low birth registration rates. They have been going up in Africa generally, but they're, they're stubbornly low in, in, in the poorest countries. And even in the countries, and I, I, I took this figure from uh, uh, Joseph Attic, who lent it to me, um, who was working with us in Djibouti, 
that uh, picture, even though you see that Djibouti suggests, says that it has a 92% birth registration rate, um, and maybe it does, these are the records of, of Djibouti's birth registration, these the birth certificates. Those are paper birth certificates. They're in order of, correct me if I'm wrong, um, alphabetical order by first name. They're not particularly going to be very useful unless a lot of work goes in to uh, digitizing these and making them queryable in, in certain ways. And of course, in many countries, the, the state of these records has deteriorated su to such a point that it's not clear that it makes a lot of sense to go that route in the first place. So it's not just the rates, but also the, 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 the condition of those records. And also remember that these rates have been going on for a long time, and some of them have gone up, but the stock, the, the people out there, uh, these are flows, right? These are what happened last year, the last five years in terms of birth registration rates. But for a very long time, these rates have been low, so you have a large stock of people that are not going to have a birth certificate. So the implications of this, to me, are that you know, often in developed countries and advanced economies, the birth registration system was the foundation for the, 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 identific, uh, the ID and the national ID as breeder documents for, for national IDs. This just isn't really possible um, in many low-income countries. Um, and if it, it is possible, to a certain extent, it's, it's going to be very difficult and expensive and time-consuming. Um, you just aren't going to have a, the stock of the population with birth certificates. Even if you improve the flow tomorrow dramatically, which we all want to do, it's going to take decades until you actually can use that as the um, foundation for, for most identification in the country. And this, by the way, applies in places like Haiti and Bangladesh and, and many low-income environments where you've had historically low birth registration rates. So the goal to me is to improve the flow of birth and death registration along with other vital statistics. Um, but capturing the stock of, of uh, individuals through national IDs programs and in such a way that the, they, these two converge eventually. And one of the things you can do to make those converge is as you have a proper uh, national ID, link that to the birth registration process through perhaps the, the mother's ID, but generally linking the CRVS, the, the civil registration, and the national ID uh, from, from here on out so that ultimately they two converge. So the next topic I wanted to cover is on electoral IDs and what's happening in, in Africa in, in that sense. And it's, again, it happens in other places outside of Africa as well, and I'll mention a few. Um, so what you see here is the coverage of the voter IDs, I think uh, Alan alluded to it yesterday, uh, versus the national IDs in a number of countries, and these are in absolute amounts. Um, but you can see that often the, the voter ID coverage is twice or more in the case of uh, Nigeria, 10 times more than the national ID coverage. Um, so there, there clearly are, it's clear that countries can roll out these IDs and they can do it very quickly, um, but they, they don't seem to do it as much for national IDs as they do for voter IDs, and that's obviously driven by certain incentives. Um, but as a result, not only, there are two, two, two big problems to me for, with this. One is, the duplication of costs. And so on the other figure, I've, I've taken some data that we've gathered and Alan Gelb has gathered at CGD and on the cost per voter uh, ID in many countries. And you can see that these are significant numbers. And we know that if we were able to channel the same kind of resources to the national ID systems, uh, you could actually create a more permanent solution. And so one of the problems with the voter IDs is that once the election is done, they just don't really maintain it, and, um, and it deteriorates. So it's expensive, and, it's, and it's, dupli it's a duplication of costs that is unnecessary. The other problem, though, is that it actually crowds out the national ID. So what happens is in places like Tanzania, you have this mass uh, take-up of the voter ID. You have 90% of the... Uh, pop, uh, the uh, voting age population with this ID, and then they use that for banking for various purposes because it, it's, it's an accepted ID, and that reduces the demand for the national ID. So this is a big problem. The donors uh, uh, have also been contributing to this problem by financing uh, these IDs, and they've realized that, and we, there are a lot of discussions now about how to move away from this system of every five years uh, spending a lot of money on a voter ID 
uh, where it could have been better spent in, in setting up a good national ID to begin with. So th this happens in, in, in other places as well. I wanted to use the Mexican example, which we, we studied recently, um, along with Nigeria, which was mentioned yesterday. Here you have, the, in, in the case of Mexico, the voter ID is very comprehensive. And a lot of folks think that the reason that there is no national ID in Mexico is because the voter ID has basically crowded it out completely. And there are political reasons that the voter ID uh, has pre -pre precluded the creation of a national ID, which has been attempted many times. And as a result, what you get in Mexico are, uh, here we have about six uh, programs, big social programs, all with biometric IDs. So you're, you're spending, you're collecting fingerprints from millions of people over and over and spending lots of money on the infrastructure and not, not really ever making a coherent system. None of these are interoperable. Um, because there's no unique underlying uh, number across these programs, you can't really uh, cross the databases and do some things in, with regard to policy that you'd like to do. So it is a big problem in Mexico, the, the lack of a, a unique ID and a national ID. Um, in the case of Nigeria, also there have been, and you saw, I think uh, there was a slide shown yesterday with uh, six or seven, or maybe we, we've got uh, about 12 ID systems of which eight, uh, according to our data, are biometric. Again, and I, I saw one reference uh, that said that about $2 billion in Nigeria has been spent on biometric IDs over the last few years. So this is a, a big problem that we need to address. What are the implications? Um, I think the electoral IDs are often getting priority funding because it's an emergency. You need to get that election uh, done, and there are good reasons for that. Um, but unfortunately, this happens on a recurring basis, and we never do get to, to a foundational ID, a national ID, that could be uh, used for this in the future. Um, and they deteriorate over time, and they, they have no incentives. The electoral uh, agencies do not have incentives, really, to link this to functional purposes like social program delivery. Um, it's not their core mandate. It's not what they would be interested in. Um, and I won't go into it, but the experience of Peru is very interesting uh, in this case because what happened was they actually split off the identification part of the uh, electoral uh, commission and let, set that up separately and made that the, a core function of its own, separate from the other parts of the election. Um, and then that was joined with the civil registration process, uh, and that was put under the same agency. And so together you had identification, legal identity with the, uh, and national ID with the uh, civil registration. And although it's been uh, coming for a long time and developing, it's, it's now one of the uh, sort of best uh, case practices that we, we know in, in the world on identification. So let me just say something very briefly on personal data protection gaps. Um, in, in Africa, very few countries actually have legislation for data protection, and probably even fewer, although we don't really have the indicators to, to, to show this, have the capacity, even when the law does exist, to actually implement it. So you can see that the majority of countries don't have any legislation. A few have bills uh, or drafts. There is some effort, apparently, going on to start to uh, create some standards in this area, um, and ECOWAS is one example. Um, but we're going to have to look, and, and I think everyone is going to have to, to consider the trade-offs, which are different, um, trade-offs between privacy and the need for identification uh, services in low-income countries uh, as opposed to rich countries. And I'm sure we'll hear more about uh, that trade-off as it's discussed in, in richer countries later today. But in low-income low countries, there really is going to be um, a, a different solution probably in the near term in terms of what the minimum standards need to be and, and what they can be, what can be enforced actually. Um, just a quick note on a very interesting idiosyncratic case, uh, just to show how specific the country context can be. Ethiopia. When you look at the, the data, it doesn't have a national ID, it doesn't have a civil registry. But when you actually go to the ground there, you find that uh, everybody has, essentially, all, of, all the adults have a form of uh, official ID. And it's, it's issued at the, what they call the Kibele level, which is 
uh, sort of a, a unit of administration of about five, 6,000 people. There's 16,000 such units, and they all issue in separate individual IDs, paper IDs with a photo, and there's no centralization. They're, all of the records are maintained at the local level, um, and, and, and they can be used for practically everything that you would use, expect to use an ID for, including getting a passport. So they're, they're extremely functional, and people do have identification, but it's extremely weak in terms of its security and how easy it is to, to, to fake these IDs. And as Ethiopia changes and starts to urbanize, they're going, their ID needs are going to be very different. But their starting point, even though when we look at the numbers, um, it seems that Ethiopia has nothing, they actually have a very, very... Uh, developed system which goes down to the level um, of 30 people in a, in a community verifying that that individual is who they are and working up through the system from that unit of 30 to the Kabele ID and then to the national level because this can be used uh, across the country. So we really do need to uh, study the initial conditions in each country to understand what we're what we're proposing, um, because to, to come in and propose to Ethiopia because they don't have a national ID, you should have a national ID, uh, misses uh, a, a very important uh, situation on the ground, which is that people actually do have IDs, they open bank accounts, they, they do all of these things that we think of being able to do with an ID already without any, what we would usually refer to as a national ID. So just to conclude, um, I think the practical approaches to creating good national ID systems have to really look very closely at those initial conditions. Um, sometimes when we look at the cross-country data, it, it just, it's very superficial and it, it hides uh, things that are going on that are very important on the ground. Um, we need to sort of stop thinking a little bit about it, applying the sort of advanced country pattern sequence of ID systems to low-income countries, uh, starting with the, the, the point that you can't rely on the birth registration systems uh, to, to build uh, the, the, the national ID uh, because it, they're, they're just, it's not been there for so long that to go retroactively and, and address the stock, you have to do something different. And that probably leads you to a situation where you start with national ID, you try to improve the flow of the birth registration, but then you try to find a way to converge those over time. Um, I mentioned the coordination of the national and the voter ID. I won't go into that anymore. And uh, minimal standards for personal data protection, which is starting to happen. And what has tended to happen, and we saw this in Latin America as well, is that the agencies responsible for open data and, and transparency and right to information, though those agencies are also dealing with the personal data protection issues, but the right to information and that open data is really the emphasis in the early stages, and it takes a little longer to, till you get to the personal data protection side. Um, and finally, uh, just that clearly we have to really, really look, and when we go into a country, we have to do our homework. We have to say, okay, what is already there on the ground in terms of um, not only the foundation IDs, the civil registry and the national ID, but other forms of identification that are being used? because. If there are other forms of identification, like in Mexico, that voter ID takes care of a lot of the functions of a national ID already. So the incentives to actually, and the benefits to the national ID are much lower in that type of situation. If we don't understand all of the forms of ID in the, in the system, then, then we're probably gonna propose something that's not very relevant. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Very much, Robert. That was a, a wonderful uh, start, a, a wonderful overview. I think also some of the, the tensions between what already is on the ground, what needs to happen moving forward. The point you made about the, the, the again the tension between uh, comprehensive and open systems and privacy. Uh, interesting that you you phased it the way you you did, or phrased that phasing is the way you did. But I thought it was a a, a very uh, extremely useful overview. So thank you so much for that. 
So we're now going to have our second uh, presenter, uh, um, Dr. Ajay Bhuchan uh, Pandey, who is the Director General of uh, the Unique Identification Authority of India, which is, as I'm sure everybody in this room knows, is the uh, authority responsible for the Aadhaar uh, system, which is the largest um, national identification system in the world. Dr. Pandey um, has, uh, is, is an Indian civil servant with uh, 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 30 years of, of, of um, experience in positions of influence and authority. He's worked on in many different areas, um, and uh, but most recently he has been uh, responsible for steering this uh, trend-setting uh, uh, program uh, in, in, in India. So we're very anxious to hear from him. So Dr. Pandey, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, it's indeed my pleasure to be here. Uh, Robert uh, gave you a brief overview of uh, uh, what's happening in Africa, and I'm go going to talk about uh, another subcontinent, uh, what's happening in India. So Aadhaar empowering a billion Indians. Let's see, uh, Aadhaar program was launched in 2010, and what was the context at that time? 1.2 billion people, 640,000 villages, literacy, 75%, less than 3% pay income tax, less than 40% people had access to formal banking, and only 30,000 habitation had banks. Then uh, the life insurance coverage, very minimal. Uh, if you talk about the financial inclusion, debit card, credit cards, bank accounts, all at a very uh, low level. And the government, federal government, used to spend close to annually uh, 60 billion US dollars on direct subsidies and payments. Now, when we talk about access to any service, the identi identity is a common requirement. If you want to open a bank account, or if you want a telephone connection, or if you want pension, if you want employment, insurance, everywhere they will ask you a formal ID. And in India, we had uh, some kind of a uh, uh, functional ID. Uh, even then, 60% of people did not have any of those functional IDs. Now the question was, okay, how, do, how do they access those services? And lack of identity means the denial of service because unless until they prove that who they are, how, how would they get access? And so therefore, they had to spend money on getting that ID first somehow, and then that obviously led to some identification cost or poverty premium. So in 2010, this whole program was launched, and then the vision was to empower residents of India with unique identity, and not only give unique identity, but also provide a national digital platform which will be accessible from everywhere to authenticate anytime, anywhere. So in Aadhaar, what do we do? Aadhaar, has, Aadhaar takes a very, very minimal set of data at the time of enrollment, and that is what we do is that we take a basic demographics, that the name, address, gender, date of birth, no relationship in the sense that we don't collect father's name, mother's name, you know, I mean, those details we don't collect. Uh, then uh, we take photographs, and then all 10 fingerprints and both iris, and then some of the other informations are optional, for example, uh, mobile phone or email ID if they have. And after we collect, we do the entire deduplication exercise. And once the deduplication exercise is successful, then we generate the Aadhaar number. Now, what are the features of Aadhaar? Uh, Aadhaar only, it is uh, basically a 12-digit number, and it has no smart cards. Uh, I would say that it doesn't have even a paper card. So it is just a digital ID number that we have given to uh, those residents. And those numbers are random numbers. And it doesn't contain any intelligence. It doesn't have any uh, data which can be uh, used for profiling. 
that you know which uh, uh, state, which area, which uh, locality that person resides. Nothing you would come to know from that. Number once issued will never be reissued. Re then Aadhaar is for all residents, including children. A lot of debate happened when we started the program, whether the Aadhaar should be given only to the citizens or to the, uh, uh, to the uh, uh, you know, resident. And what we thought at that time is that if we get into that debate, we will never be able to do that. Because the citizenship issue is a very, very vexed issue, particularly when you don't have any record, for example, birth record and other records. If you don't have, how will you determine whether somebody is a citizen of India or not? And so therefore, we thought that let's not, uh, let's deal with that whole issue. And we said that if you are a resident, then you will get an Aadha and we give it to all children, including the infants. Then uniqueness is ensured through uh, biometric attributes. We have a strict data collection and quality verification and deduplication program. And we also have uh, enrollment and update from anywhere in the country. We have seen various models where the IDs are generated uh, in any program in the village or in the city where you reside. And here, one can get enrolled anywhere in the country. I may live in Mumbai, but if I happen to visit Delhi, I can go and enroll myself in Delhi. So that's the kind of a, a power of choice we have given to the people so that they can get enrolled. Uh, enrolled. Once they get Aadhaar, we also recognize that uh, the many other things will change. For example, my photograph would change, or my address would change, or my mobile number will change. So if there are some changes, then the changes can also take place by visiting any of those centers uh, nationwide, or even going online, many of the things can be changed, uh, or updates can happen. Then we have also made it very clear that Aadhaar it's by itself doesn't confer any rights to citizenship or other entitlement. Aadhaar is just a basic identity document. It just basically proves that uh, uh, the, uh, you are the person who you are claiming to be. And rest of the things are, uh, about the rights and entitlement, for that, uh, for that a separate process has to be followed. Then we also try to ensure the security and the privacy of information collected. And we uh, have given a Solomon undertaking through our policy and everything that our data, whatever data that we have collected from, uh, from the resident, will not be shared without the consent of a resident. We'll talk about uh, this later. Then also we have established uh, you know, online authentication system, which can be accessible across the country. Uh, in authentication system, uh, we have, uh, 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 this can work through the various communication channel. It could come, it, it could be through the 2G networks, 3G networks, through the broadband, through, you know, all kinds of networks where person puts his fingerprint or the iris and gives Aadhaar number and then our data center responds with answer yes and no. Or even we give some basic KYC details. So basically, effectively, what has happened is that, uh, you know, we had a situation prior to 2010 when the majority of people had no ID. And then uh, instead of going through the entire transition process where one would have a paper ID and then the smart ID and then, you know, coming to a digital ID, we have kind of a leapfrogged from a basically a situation of no ID to a digital ID. Now, the mandate of UIDI was to first to do enrollment then uh, uh, establish uh, not only do only the enrollment, but also a system of authentication where the people can, uh, people uh, would be able to authenticate from anywhere and any time. And then also establish, uh, 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 help uh, develop applications so that people using this identi identification uh, platform can uh, use that, that in their service delivery. Uh, uh, and that can be by central government, state governments, and service providers in the public and the private sectors. Now, what was our design philosophy? Uh, when we were uh, planning this program, uh, that time we, uh, uh, we, uh, uh, we tried to, uh, uh, you know, there were various choices because we already had uh, some uh, several database existing. For example, we had a voter ID database. We had a PDS public distribution system databases. And instead of using that database to build this, we said that let us start de novo and start with a minimal data. That is just a basic demographics and uh, capture the uh, biometrics and from there you build this. And so, so we had this uh, very minimal data approach and uh, uh, a de novo uh, 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 creation of a de novo database. 
uh, highly scalable and we also ensured a robust data security, low marginal cost. Uh, uh, in terms of cost, you know, I just now I was just seeing this, uh, you know, uh, what the Robert was presented, uh, presenting. In, in the countries uh, have spent uh, 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 per ID, uh, 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 the cost is from a couple of dollars to maybe around 20, 22 dollars. In India, we have uh, given close to almost uh, 930 million Aadhaar we have given and total expenditure during the last five years is just close to $1 billion. So basically, we have been able to generate Aadhaar for $1 uh, uh, per Aadhaar. That's the kind of cost that has uh, come. Then uh, we have uh, complied with all the standards. Wherever the standards were not there, we have kind of created our own standards. And the entire uh, system is uh, uh, based on open source, open platform, and also we have ensured vendor neutrality. Uh, we have also uh, have a special pro provisions for marginalized and uh, people you know who are living in slums, who are living living in the streets, living in remote villages. Uh, there, uh, what uh, what we do? Uh, we have a special camps for enrolling such people so that you know they don't get left out. And also, we have made provisions for the people uh, who uh, uh, who ha who may have some biometric exceptions because we recognize that uh, uh, people may not have all uh, fingerprints or people may have uh, may not have irises so in such a situation what should be done so this is what we have done uh, you know whatever uh, uh, our enrollment or authentication uh, every transaction <coughs> that we do is auditable and non repudiable for example when the enrollment is done by an operator that operator himself should have an uh, should have an aadhar id and every enrollment is uh, biometrically signed by that operator and the moment the enrollment is done the entire data even before it is saved to the disk it is uh, it is encrypted in the memory and that data uh, gets transferred to our data center and in our data center uh, 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 that uh, biometric data is decrypted only for the fraction of the milliseconds when the it is goes goes through the deduplication process thereafter it remains encrypted for all times now, uh, this is the Aadhaar enrollment ecosystem. Uh, I will talk about a little bit about the ecosystem. Uh, in order to create uh, this, uh, this uh, program, uh, do this pro project, a uh, usual approach of the government would have been that create a huge machinery, employ 10,000 of people, and then, uh, then, uh, and then uh, uh, do this project. In this project, this entire our organization, our organization UIDI, employs not more than 500 people uh, nationally, right? And so what we did was that we, we created, uh, we used a system of registrar. So you, we used the existing uh, uh, infrastructure within the country. Uh, so we appointed state governments as our registrars. We uh, appointed uh, banks, uh, public sector banks as our registrars, who in turn employed the private agencies and who in turn employed the uh, operators uh, uh, and and then the, uh, they did the job. Uh, we can see the kind of response that we were getting from the field when this enrollment camp was going on, and the people were turning out in such a huge uh, queue, and uh, and then they were uh, uh, you know very much uh, uh, interested in getting that Aadhaar. Uh, I must uh, mention here that Aadhaar from the very beginning has been voluntary. We have never said that Aadhaar will be is uh, mandatory or Aadhaar will be required for such and such services, but because people wanted some nationally uh, recognizable ID, so the people uh, on their own they came uh, came forward and then they uh, uh, they uh, they came for the enrollment. Uh, we have uh, we have a 78 registrar, 310 enrollment agencies. Total uh, number of certified operator across the country, 320,000 operators. At, at any point of time, more than 40,000 enrollment centers are working in our country, in the, across the country. We have the capacity to generate more than 2 million Aadhaars every day. We are able to enroll more than 2 million Aadhaar every day, but on an average, we, uh, we uh, do generate 1 million per day. We print and dispatch uh, that Aadhaar letter communication up to the tune of 1.5 million every day. These are some of the, uh, you know, the whole enrollment process. You can see here the, how an uh, infant is getting enrolled, how school children are getting enrolled, how uh, women, uh, and then uh, this whole kind of a camp, and then in the village, this is how this whole uh, enrollment exercise was done. Now, where are we? We started in 2010, 
and then uh, as we speak, uh, we have crossed 930 <coughs> million in uh, 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 enrollment uh, in our country, and that makes it as the largest uh, uh, ID database in our country. We have a passport, 57 million voter ID card, 600 million, but none of those uh, IDs have a deduplication feature or online authentication feature. So that's the something very, very distinctive. So today in India, uh, people may not have any other ID, but then at least, you know, they will have this Aadhaar ID. So when we talk about this 930 million people uh, uh, in a population of 1.2 billion, if we, uh, if we uh, see only the adults, uh, more than 94% of the adults have, uh, have Aadhaar today. So, so, so that's the kind of a saturation we have, uh, uh, we, we, we have received, uh, you know, we have achieved uh, in the country. Now, uh, after, along with the uh, enrollment, we have also parallelly established Aadhaar authentication service. Now the Aadhaar, uh, because what we realized was that giving a, just an ID wouldn't serve the purpose unless somebody is able to authenticate himself, right? Because after all, we are not giving any smart card or any, any you know, some, uh, uh, some other uh, uh, kind of a card. So people need to uh, still uh, uh, verify that, uh, you know, verify the identity of the person. So we have uh, established this authentication system and this can happen in a variety of means. Uh, you know, one can do uh, Aadhaar and one fingerprint or Aadhaar or multiple fingerprint or Aadhaar and iris, you know, all kinds of combinations are possible. And then we either give answer yes or no, or in case if supposing some organization wants the basic KYC details, we uh, also share the details only when it is uh, biometrically, uh, uh, you know, permitted by the uh, person in the sense that once the person puts this fingerprint or the, gives the iris, we, uh, we share those uh, EKYC information. Now, this is the Aadhaar authentication ecosystem that we have built. That, uh, 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 that uh, uh, the data that we have, uh, uh, this uh, identity data, that is shared through the authentication system and we have this uh, uh, system of uh, uh, authentication user agency and then <coughs> KYC user agencies and they come uh, to our data center, the requests are sent to our data centers through the secure lines and then uh, we give the response uh, either the yes or no or EKYC with the res uh, consent of the resident and total uh, bio authentications uh, uh, which are being performed every day is uh, 2 million and we have the capacity to do 100 million authentication every day. So this is the kind of uh, infrastructure that we have set up and uh, so far uh, uh, if we see ever since the beginning total number of authentication transactions which have been performed is about 830 million. So this is, uh, this is how uh, the people are able to use uh, Aadhaar for their processes. Now, what are the value proposition of Aadhaar? Uh, we have uniqueness. Then uh, uh, we also have uh, uh, authentication uh, system established, EKYC. And also we are working along with the Reserve Bank of India and the uh, uh, other branches of government to make Aadhaar as a financial address. So we'll talk about it a uh, little later. Now, what are the benefits for the resident? Uh, it is a lifetime identity for the resident. It is a convenience, a resident can get access to services wherever they are. And also what is most important is that this ID is nationally portable. In the sense that, you know, I may belong to one state, but then I can take this ID and go and access services anywhere. So this ID is portable and then my entitlement also, which is linked to that ID, also becomes portable. So for example, if I'm, uh, uh, what the government also is planning that let's say I am a beneficiary of LPG cylinder, right, you know, cylinder. And I may be living in Mumbai, but supposing if I move to some other city, but because it is linked to Aadhaar number, I can, I can get those services uh, in the other cities uh, also. So, so this is how uh, this leads to na uh, uh, national, uh, nationwide portability, empowerment, and of course, instant access. Now, Aadhaar is a financial uh, ad address. So we have worked with an arm of Reserve Bank of India, uh, it's a National Payment Corporation of India, where a, where a mapper has been established, where every Aadhaar number is linked to a, a, bank, a, a designated bank account. And so if a money has to be transferred, the money can be transferred to that Aadhaar number, then the mapper <coughs> provides the uh, linked bank account number and then the money can be transferred. So this is an example of you where, you know, if I have to transfer a money to, uh, to a person or beneficiary, I don't need to know 
uh, uh, his bank account and straight away the money can get uh, transferred uh, to that uh, person's bank account through the Aadhaar payment bridge and uh, thereafter once the money uh, comes to that bank account the uh, the uh, uh, the person is able to withdraw that money without going to the bank because we also have a kind of a rolled out uh, micro ATMs which are being uh, operated by uh, more than 87,000 banking correspondents uh, who are basically like a human ATM. They go with this a small device that we can see and then they can go to the village and then the person puts the fingerprint and Aadhaar number and then the money is uh, given or the money is accepted. So this is how the whole uh, uh, the concept works. So I have given some numbers like, you know, key banks which are actually live on this Aadhaar payment bridge 693, bank account opened uh, with the Aadhaar EKYC 12 million and these are some of the transaction figures. Now, the service at the doorsteps. Now, I have, I have mentioned about the, some, uh, some, uh, some of the government programs which have started using Aadhaar for uh, rolling out their services. Like, uh, we have an employment scheme called uh, Manreg, uh, MN, uh, MNREGS. There are total 90 million workers. Out of that, 30 million workers have already been linked to Aadhaar. And there, out of that, 10 million workers are being paid through Aadhaar. So when I'm saying that 10 million workers are being paid to Aadhaar, they don't have to travel to a bank, <coughs> which could be maybe, you know, 30 miles away. And then uh, in that process earlier, they used to leave, uh, they used to, uh, they had to forgo one day wages because, you know, they will take that much time to travel to the bank. So in this situation, what happens is that he or she is able to get wages in the village itself, uh, again, through, this, uh, through the banking correspondent and the micro ATM. Similarly, the social pensions, 25 million beneficiaries out of 6 million uh, beneficiaries are linked to Aadhaar and they, they can get paid through the Aadhaar. Now, LPG is another uh, uh, you know, major uh, exercise which was done that we have about 140 million uh, LPG consumer. Out of that, 80 million consumers have been linked to Aadhaar and their subsidy is being paid every month into the Aadhaar bank link account, which can again be withdrawn right in the village or right at the doorstep through the banking correspondent. Similarly, the retirement pensions. Uh, uh, we have a very, uh, 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 very archaic, uh, we had a, a very archaic system where every pensioner had to physically present himself in a bank branch once in a year to prove that he's alive. And, and, then, uh, and then mostly uh, the people had to go only to the main branch where the pension account, account was being operated. And that was a very massive problem. Imagine a person 80 years or 90 years old living with children would have to, uh, you know, go to the uh, home, uh, you know, uh, home city and home uh, bank branch to prove that, you know, that person is alive. Now, using this Aadhaar authentication, <coughs> once you have authenticated biometrically, it means that you are alive. And then the life certificate is generated. So this is the one of the programs which was recently launched by our prime minister. Now, about the bank account, uh, we have... A, a, uh, 210 million bank accounts uh, uh, which are now linked with Aadhaar and they are actually on the Aadhaar payment bridge. So beneficiaries of all those 210 million bank accounts can now do this doorstep banking through the micro ATM. And, and here again we can see here that the 70 million bank accounts were open using Aadhaar because now Aadhaar is the most widely prevalent document in our country. Now, I mean, here are, the, here are some of the uh, just uh, pictures that how these services are being delivered to the people at their uh, doorstep or in the villages or in the cities or, you know, or in the areas or localities where they live. Now, what are the benefits to the government and the private sector service provider? Of course, it removes fakes and duplicates uh, 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 and then end-to-end -end transparency, identification, outrage, productivity, inclusion. And I have listed here some of the areas where, you know, uh, to what extent the duplication and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, were eliminated and what's the kind of saving. Now the LPG, uh, this LPG cylinder, uh, it is a documented, uh, uh, you know, it, it was documented by the government of India that when they launched this program and they started linking with Aadhaar, they found that 15% you know, of the beneficiaries didn't turn up. And then that 15% beneficiary, that meant that a saving of $2 billion US dollars <coughs> every year. And uh, uh, you know, we have spent only $1 billion over the last five years. And here is a one program which is giving a saving of $2 billion US dollars uh, every year. Then uh, in case of a PDS, 
uh, in certain areas, uh, in some districts of Andhra Pradesh, uh, this particular pilot was done where they uh, tried to link Aadhaar with the public distribution system, and they again found that there also they had a saving of 10 to 15 percent. If you do it nationally, then uh, then there also it is a, it, is, it has the potential to uh, save this much. Similarly, about the education and scholarship, and then many other sectors where uh, this, uh, this Aadhaar can be used to make the system very transparent and also uh, it will remove uh, fakes and duplicates and, 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 and reduce the, uh, 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 the subsidy burden. The areas where uh, this can be applied, every day when I'm sitting in my office, uh, most of the departments, they, uh, because the Aadhaar is the most widely prevalent document, they, whenever they have a problem of uh, 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 the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, in the administration of the scheme, be it uh, in terms of uh, duplicates or fakes or or some uh, intermediaries uh, not allowing the benefits to reach people, they would uh, they they have started thinking in terms of how to use Aadhaar so that uh, the whole system can be streamlined. So already uh, uh, in the health, education, insurance, and other uh, public assistance, uh, even the voters ID, for example. Now the Election Commission of India started a massive program to link voter ID with Aadhaar so that you know the uh, the uh, uh, voter which who is who is uh, recorded in a multi multiple uh, uh, cities as a voter they can be eliminated or the voters who have who uh, uh, you know who are not there they can be eliminated so this this kind of exercise seeding exercise is uh, being undertaken uh, in many other databases so now this is uh, uh, about the legal challenges. We had a, 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 a very uh, a long drawn, and we are, we are still in the middle of a, a very uh, serious, uh, uh, you know, legal challenge. Uh, there are twelve petitions have been filed in the Supreme Court of India by the different parties, and they all they all are being heard together. Uh, the the uh, the, uh, the issues uh, range from lack of legal status to UIDI because there is uh, no law has yet been passed by the parliament. Then. Uh, People have raised questions about the biometric technology, not a proven technology, the fear of hacking, uh, theft of biometric data, artificial biometrics. Somebody will use artificial biometrics to you know, get into my account. And then um, uh, inconvenience to old and infirm. Infirm would be excluded, and uh, uh, which will lead to denial of uh, service. Uh, then uh, illegal immigrants will be sued Aadhaar. And then the fear of breach of pers uh, uh, personal privacy. And then uh, 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 capturing of biometrics is a serious breach of privacy. Then uh, uh, potential of data aggregation and profiling and the big brother behavior by, uh, by the government. So these are the uh, you know, major challenges uh, which uh, have been posed to, uh, to our scheme. And last month, you know, we had a very detailed hearing. And uh, the court has not yet stopped us from doing any, uh, you know, they have not issued any orders asking us not to do the enrollment. They have allowed us to do the enrollment. They have also allowed us to use Aadhaar for the public services program. But yes, the court has, uh, uh, in fact, you know, we had told the court because uh, most of these uh, issues pertain to uh, data privacy and security. We, people feel that, you know, this data will be uh, shared across uh, maybe some intelligence agency or maybe some security agency or somebody else and then uh, this will lead to uh, surveillance and this Aadhaar which is right now a development project might become a security and surveillance project. So this is the kind of apprehensions which have been expressed in the court and we have uh, always assured the court that this is a development project and no data is going to be shared uh, from our side to uh, any of the even government security agencies without the consent of the resident. In fact, when I mentioned that, 12 petitions have been filed uh, in the Supreme Court. Out of that, one petition has been filed by us. We filed a petition against our own government uh, agency called Central Bureau of Investigation, which is, equ uh, which is equivalent to FBI in, uh, in uh, United States. So FBI, uh, CBI wanted biometric uh, data of some people uh, for the purpose of uh, uh, some crime investigation. And we said that, no, we can't give you th that data because if I give that data, then you know, the whole program will collapse. And then the matter first went to the lower court. Lower court, they got a favorable order, CBI. And then we challenged that uh, order in a high court, which is the highest court in a, uh, in a state of Maharashtra, in Mumbai High Court. And they got a favorable order from Mumbai High Court also. 
So against that order, you know, we went to the Supreme Court and we said that, look, this data we, we would not give even to our security agency, I mean, security or investigation agency. And there the Supreme Court supported us and said that this biometric data or, or for that matter, any other data shall not be given to any government agency or any other agency without the consent of the resident. So that's, the, that's where the situation is uh, right now. Uh, right now, the matter uh, has been uh, uh, debated before the five judge constitution bench and then the issue of privacy. Uh, because earlier there, there were some judgments uh, uh, about 30, 40 years back where uh, it was uh, held by our Supreme Court saying that uh, privacy is not a fundamental right. Uh, unless and until it impacts the basic life and liberty in the sense that you know every intrusion of privacy is not an intrusion on the fundamental right in fact there are some parallel uh, judgments uh, also in us also where they say that every intrusion uh, uh, is uh, perhaps not the breach of privacy and intrusion has to be weighed with the uh, governmental interest uh, uh, so so uh, so so we are trying to argue on that basis so the matter has now been referred to a nine judge Supreme Court uh, bench. So, uh, so, so uh, that's where the matter is there. And parallelly, uh, we also have a, our own legislation pending in the parliament. And uh, hopefully during the next few years, we will have our uh, parliament, uh, you know, the bill passed, the, uh, we will have a uh, act on the UIDI <coughs> and also this whole issue of uh, 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 privacy, uh, uh, so far as the use of uh, collection of uh, biometrics, uh, 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 for Aadhaar is concerned, that also will get settled in the Supreme Court. Thank you. Ajay, thank you very much for that uh, whirlwind tour of Aadhaar, which is this extraordinary uh, program, of course, in a way, the elephant in any room uh, discussing national identification. So thank you for that. I think you've uh, laid out so many issues for us to think about, and I'm sure there will be uh, questions uh, on some of the points you've raised. Um, our next speaker is Ian Watson, who is an associate, associate professor in the Media Technology Lab at Jovic. University, Jovic, uh, University College in Norway. Um, uh, Professor Watson has uh, worked extensively on national identification numbers in Iceland, so we're moving from the deep south to the far north. Um, and uh, it's a, Iceland, which is one of the world's most open and widely used personal numbering systems. So he's uh, uh, an expert on that. Um, He's uh, also got an interest in, in the history of civil registration. And we saw yesterday, I think, in, in Mia's presentation, some of the sort of historical antecedents to the systems we have now. He's worked on historical issues as well. Um, so thank you very much for joining us, Ian. So we're yes, we're moving from the the elephant to the the flea or maybe maybe the puffin. It's uh, it's from a, one of the world's most populous countries to one of the world's least populous countries. There's actually interesting points of similarity between Aadhaar and and the Scandinavian systems. There's also some important points of difference, and uh, I'm honored to be having the chance to to show you how the national identification system in Iceland works today. <coughs> so this is my kennitala, that's the Icelandic word, 1801-70-2359. Everyone in Iceland has one of these. It's 10 digits long, and people use it more or less like their name. So they use it in all kinds of communications, on their tax returns, at the doctor, at schools, at the bank, uh, paying their hot water bill really for, for, uh, for many, many, many different things. So if I take... 
one of my children to the doctor in Iceland, they want to make sure they call up the right record and not somebody else's. And they don't want to know my daughter's name in words here. They want to know her numerical name in, in quotes. Uh, conversations like this in, in Iceland follow a certain sort of ritualized form. So I would go in, I, they would say, Kenitala. I would say 27021040. They would type that in. Up would come my daughter's name on the screen. They would say, Anna Laura, I would say, yes. So that's, that they, that's how they know they've gotten the right person. And the first six digits in Iceland of the Kenitala are the birth date. So from this, you can also see that my daughter is going to be six years old on the, the 27th of, of, of February. Now, Icelanders don't hide their Kenitala or try to keep it secret. So this is just one of many examples. I took this photo of a petition that was tacked up in a public area at the University of Iceland a few years ago. And this petition is nothing so controversial. It asks for longer opening hours in the library during exam period. And you can see that the petition has spaces for everybody to put their name and Kenitala on it. It was you know, typed up that way and printed out that way. And that's what everybody did. And I would say, I would propose that we can think of it this way, that if we, we use a sort of analytical term, that Icelanders have desacralized the idea of referring to people by number. Now, if we think about how things work in America, and of course, I'm originally American and have spent many years in Iceland now, uh, we, we disclose our social, our social security number in America in rather rarefied circumstances. When we do, metaphorically speaking, we check that the door to the confessional is closed and that nobody but the priest can hear us. So there's a certain sort of um, ceremonial aspect of disclosing our social security number in American culture. Icelanders, on the other hand, they disclose it out on the market square in front of everybody. So it's a, a, I, I think we can use the term desacralization for that, that process. In fact, in Iceland, what's even more interesting and what's maybe different from Adar is that everybody's Kenitala is public. There's a database based on the National Register and it lists everybody's name, their Kenitala, and their address. And you can see it up here on the slide. And that means, by the way, also that anyone can find out your birth date, which is something that goes along with the historical openness about ages in, in Northern European culture. So this database is available on every bank website. And the reason for that is that in order to transfer money to somebody else in Iceland, you need to know their Kenitala and their bank account number. So if you need easier access to the National Register than this kind of interface, you can purchase a subscription. That's really only meant for institutions and priced accordingly. And in the pre-computer age, the National Register was available in printed form at libraries. So you could go look it up. It was organized by, by street address. And you could see the names and ages and, and uh, information on everybody living in a particular place. Now, again, I want to offer you a sort of a way of thinking about this. I think that most of us, at least in, in the US, we think about referring to people by number as very different from referring to them by name. But let me just ask you all for a moment to think about the conceptual domain of personal address afresh for a moment, and perhaps to see linguistic and numerical names as <coughs> forming a kind of a continuum. We all know that we have more and less formal versions of our names that we use in different contexts. And so you can see a numerical name, again, I'd say that in quotes, as just another contextually dependent name. So this is an example. This is a, a good friend and colleague of mine. And I call him Oli. But I notice that his aunt, who I also work with, calls him Oli Ra which is probably the nickname that was used with him when he was a small child. So his nickname plus his middle name. But if I was referring somebody to him who didn't know him already, I would call him Olavra, using the full version of his first name. And then if he was signing his name or listing his name on a, you know, the staff directory or something like that, he would include his 
last name, which is really an Icelander patronymic. So Olavur Hrapp Juliusson, he would give the whole thing. And then let's say that I was the treasurer of the Icelandic bird watching society and he was a member and I needed to send him his annual membership dues bill. In Iceland, you do that by getting the list of everybody's kenitalas and giving that to the bank. And the bank has a service where for like a couple of dollars per person, they'll actually send out the bill and it will show up in people's online banking uh, account. So I would need to know his, his number for that, and he would give it to me freely. It wouldn't be a problem for him. And if you think about it this way, it makes Icelandic personal address customs seem perhaps a little bit less exotic. And maybe it also helps explain why, you know, people have sometimes asked me when the whole subject of Icelandic ID numbers comes up, don't Icelanders find it demeaning to be just a number? <coughs> but actually nobody in Iceland seems to feel that way. It doesn't mean you're any less of a person to identify yourself by number. It's simply just what you do in particular contexts. Now, there's a peculiar aspect of Icelandic naming customs that makes the Kenitala especially practical. And that is that traditionally, Icelandic parents don't decide on a baby's name until the baby is baptized, which is usually at the age of several weeks. And Icelandic parents are, in fact, they're not required by, by law to name children at birth, unlike in some other countries where you, you have to show up at the hospital with a name or sometimes two names. And many Icelandic kids simply just don't have a name in words for the first few weeks. But their kenitala is assigned within just minutes of birth. So newborn babies leave the hospital onomastically equipped for participation in society, pretty much full participation in society. You can take them to the doctor. You can even open a bank account for them with no problem, even though they don't have a name. And what the National Register does is it lists as yet unnamed children with boy or girl in lowercase in the first name slot. And you can see that up here. If you just look at the orange, this is my, my oldest child. Uh, he was, uh, he, this is a screenshot that I took just uh, uh, within a few days or a week or two after his birth. And he's called Drenkur Watson. So Drenkur means boy. And you can see his kenitala has already been assigned. You can see his address there. You can see me a few lines down with my kenitala and my address, the same address. And that's because we hadn't filed the form with the National Registry yet to say what his, his name would be. By law, parents in Iceland have to choose a name before the child is six months old. Now, I think that mandatory reg residence registration makes the Icelandic identification system more secure. So the name and address that correspond to each kenitala are public. And when a transaction is executed against a given kenitala in whichever system, a paper notification can be mailed to the legal residence of the person who's holding that number. And Icelanders now can register an email address for communication with government bodies. And so, you know, if somebody takes out a mortgage in my name, then I will hear about it fairly quickly on paper one way or another. And actually, identity theft in Iceland is is virtually non-existent. Uh, you can check, uh, this, I've checked with the police and uh, they said that they had uh, something like three cases a year which could be perhaps <coughs> classed as something like identity theft. It's, it's uh, in public discourse, I can barely detect any concern about identity theft in Iceland. Now most European countries have a reg residence registration system. I think that the issues of residence registration and national identification numbering are closely connected in the sort of global uh, north. And I note that several countries with an Anglo-Saxon heritage lack both national ID numbers and residence registration. And in those countries, I wonder whether the, those, those two issues and the future of those two issues is going to be linked. Now, in Iceland, Corporations and organizations are also free to use the Kenitala as a client or customer ID, and they generally do so. And that includes insurance, schools, the power company, library, associations that you belong to, and so forth. There's nothing to stop them using their own internal ID schemes as well, but providing corporations and organizations and associations with a single unique name for each person is something that you can think of as a public service. It's not really all that unlike 
uh, numbering houses and, and putting up names for streets. And that means, for example, that universities don't need to use resources to maintain a separate student ID number. There is no ID card in Iceland, no national ID card in Iceland. There is only the number, and in that way, it's, that's one of the points of similarity with Atar. Uh, and so in face-to-face -face situations where people have to prove their identity, they usually use a driver's license or a debit card. And, and both of those carry the, the owner's kenitala and a photo and a signature. And there are now actually several competing systems for online authentication as well. It's a whole interesting topic that I'm not going to cover today that's just uh, become important in the last couple of years. There's no biometric collection for the National Register in Iceland, although uh, there is some information that's collected when you apply for a passport, if you do. There, I, I want to just, uh, it's a minor point, but there was once an ID card system in Iceland too in the 1960s and I, I put up a, a copy of what, what they look like. It's fallen out of use. The original point of it was so that people could prove their age, at, as young people could prove their age when going to some place where alcohol was served. And today it's, it's, uh, you can actually technically still get <coughs> one if you want because the law is still on the books, but nobody does. So the Icelandic system is it's not built on a physical token at all. It's built on symbols, on semantics, on, on, on a kind of numerical mantra rather than anything that you can carry. I don't want to give the impression that Iceland is completely unified about the policy about the Kenitala. There's sometimes been a certain amount of disunity and debate over the proper design of the system. And in, particu in particular, around 2000 to 2004, there was a polite public disagreement between the head of the National Registry, who you see here on the left, Hat Grimur, and the head of the Icelandic Data Protection <coughs> Authority, whose name was Sigrun, about the use of the Kenitala. And this resulted in a certain sort of compromise in which access to the National Register was restricted slightly. It used to be that the National Registry itself maintained a website where you could look up everybody's number. But this was really a trivial and almost symbolic concession. And in my judgment, most of the criticism of the Kenitala system in Iceland has been, has had sort of alarmist tendencies and sometimes populist tendencies. And it's been a minority viewpoint. On the whole, the Icelandic Kenitala seems to be a stable institution that people are relatively satisfied with. And uh, there was a, a, one discussion where Hatgrimur took the position that the Kenitala is really a useful tool that helps people to assert their rights and to guard their assets. And in that, I think he was coming close to the perspective that we're hearing from many people here about the, the uh, importance of identification to, to human rights issues. Now, I'm getting to the end here. I follow identification and civil registration issues in the United States loosely, partly through my long time involvement with, uh, with genealogy. And my perspective mixes having grown up here and understanding how things work here with my 15 years of having lived in Iceland. And so when I see the emotions that surface in public discourse here in the United States, I feel a little bit bemused and sometimes, frankly, a little bit upset or troubled. You know, in these, this is just a collage of some news coverage that I've seen over the past few years. And you see words like millions affected, uh, things that must end and now, hand wringing, clamping down, cyber attacks. Uh, you look at the body language in the photo set in front of the flag. Here you can see the black bands of redaction of public documents. And these feelings don't generally surface in serious discourse about the Kenitala in Iceland. We have rather polite discussions, for example, about whether it's good to continue including the birth date in the Kenitala, there are pros and cons, or whether banks should be able to demand that you identify yourself when you're changing foreign currency, paper money. And it may be, you know, some people 
may imagine that there's a kind of Scandinavian exceptionalism that makes open personal ID numbers work in these small, peaceful societies, but not elsewhere. And there may be something to that, but I, I think that it, it shouldn't be pushed too far or used as a way of dismissing the lessons that we can possibly lear, learn from these systems. Today, in 2015, Scandinavian societies are in any case not quite so homogenous and lovey-dovey as they may at one point have been seen as. They're not Mayberries. Um, 50 years ago, you know, when the King of Norway was photographed taking the public bus to go skiing, uh, Scandinavia was, was perhaps much more homogenous, but now they are societies that are dealing with things like immigration, human trafficking, uh, refugee crises, and so forth. I think that a key feature is that there is no value in knowing somebody's kenitala in Iceland, and that's really important to understanding the success of the system. There's no more value to knowing somebody's kenitala than to knowing somebody's name. Go ahead, steal my kenitala. You, you won't be able to monetize it any more than you could monetize knowing my name. And that contrasts with the American style in which being able to state your social security number has potential monetary value in certain situations. The social security number is a kind of a half secret, like your signature. That means a secret that you're constantly having to divulge. And after 15 years in Iceland, the American anxiety about social security number disclosure feels rather strange to me. And the SSN feels like a bit of an unstable institution for that reason. I ask, if, if we, in America, if we want to have a government-issued secret code to authenticate ourselves with, then maybe we ought to design one purposefully and use it just for that and not for other purposes. Now, I, just in closing, I have to admit that I don't know <coughs> all that much about national ID numbers outside Scandinavia. I also want to underscore that Iceland is a very small country of 320,000 people. So I don't want to suggest that other larger countries take the Icelandic or the Scandinavian approaches without thinking them over carefully. But there's a couple points about the system that I think you can take away from this talk today. And here they are. Uh, open national ID number systems where all the numbers are public may actually be more secure or robust than those which are laden with supposedly protect protective security features. And I think it's a little bit similar to how open source software like Linux has been less susceptible to viruses than closed source software like, my like Microsoft Windows. Second, the issue of national ID numbers is at least in the so-called developed countries linked to the issue of, of residence registration. And Three, Icelanders have desacralized the difference between linguistic names and numerical names in a way that I think bears attention. And last, you can have a functioning national ID system with numbers alone and no cards, as India is proving today. Now, this is the last slide. This here is my original article about the Icelandic ID number system. And... Personal numbering systems in the other Scandinavian countries are roughly generally similar to Iceland's, but use of the Kenitala in Iceland is particularly widespread and open. And I suspect that Iceland is the most extreme of the Scandinavian national ID numbering cases. So it would be very useful to have a modest historical study of the broader Scandinavian experience with numbering systems, and I wonder if it could help inform debates in other part, parts of the world. Uh, Karl Jakob Krogness has written about the Danish civil registration system. The last time I checked, there wasn't a lot of easily digestible information about the Finnish or Norwegian systems, only a little bit about the Swedish nor has anybody really taken a pan-Nordic approach. I mention this partly out of self-interest. I'm working in Norway these days, and I'd love to find time to tell the story of the Norwegian ID number system. But if any of you are interested in seeing progress in our understanding of the Scandinavian systems, I would, uh, I would love to, to talk to you about that. And otherwise, I'm just very thankful for the, <coughs> this chance to present the Icelandic story to you and eager to discuss it further. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ian. The trouble with these presentations, they're all so interesting that I'm being a lousy chair. 
But um, I, I think that was just a fascinating story uh, and probably unknown to, to many of us in the room. So thank you for sharing it with us. And again, I'm sure uh, people will, will have questions and comments about, about some of your points. So the last speaker on this panel, uh, who's already here and waiting, is Edgar uh, Whiteley, who is the, um, an Associate Professor of uh, Information Systems at the LSE. He's an expert on information technology and has been working in this field for a long time. Um, he he covers his, his research deals with issues of um, identity policy, privacy, cloud computing, and public management. So he, he really spans broadly across uh, the field of information technology. He's published um, on the topic, and he's also quite involved and been quite involved in policy uh, debates and policy issues uh, in England uh, related to identity, where there's a very different, extremely different approach to um, identity numbers and identity cards and identi national identification generally than there is, uh, for example, in, in Iceland or indeed in India. So, Edgar, it's a great pleasure to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak. So what I want to talk about is the implications from the UK system, which has a particular emphasis on privacy issues and also has some interesting consequences in terms of <coughs> digital innovations. And to kind of give you a story through that, I'll explain my own particular involvement uh, in the UK uh, evolving identity policy uh, approach. And just as a kind of a flagging a starting point, privacy versus security versus robustness isn't a contrast. You can achieve all of those policy goals uh, in the same uh, way. So let's go back 10 years, almost exactly, just 10 and a half years now. Uh, in the UK, the recently re-elected Blair government, remember him, he was our prime minister, uh, had a proposal to introduce biometric identity cards based around a centralized database for all UK citizens and residents. It's different cards if you are a resident because the UK has lots of uh, visitors, students, internationals, etc., etc. This was intended to be a voluntary system. And whenever people talk about voluntary systems, I immediately start to get a little bit uneasy because often voluntary is used as a, essentially a lie to fool people into thinking it's not going to be a problem. So the British proposals were voluntary uh, because you only would get an ID card when you renewed your passport. And of course, that means, as far as the government was concerned, if you didn't want to have a passport so that you couldn't come to Boston to speak at events like this, you didn't have to enroll into the National Identity Register. So voluntary uh, is one of those questions that, as an academic at least, you need to be very, very careful uh, about. Our, one of the concerns that we had with the system was that there was this, going to be this centralized database of all the details of everybody, and as with Adhar, there would be this nice audit trail of every time your card was formally checked. So essentially, the British government was building in a surveillance system by design. Every time you explicitly checked your ID card against the data held on the central register, an audit record would be created and, of course, national security services are never going to be interested in accessing that data. So we wrote a 300-page uh, report based on our concerns that were coming from a variety of different stakeholders who were simply saying lots of the claims that the government is making about the way that they're designing their system are not as clear-cut and not as straightforward as the government is particularly arguing. We made a, a different view, different assessment, based on a wide variety of different considerations, uh, including costs. So the Prime Minister, when we released our report, said, particularly with regards to our cost uh, estimates, some of the figures bandied around about cost are absolutely absurd. The uh, Home Secretary, the Interior Minister, Charles Clark, said the LSE work was technically incompetent. So, caveat emptor, you're being talked to, talk to by someone who's done work that's technically incompetent. 
and our figures were simply mad, he accused LSE of running a campaign against ID cards. So in our report, we argued, for example, that of the people that we were consulting with in industry and lawyers, etc., etc., that the proposals were too complex, technically unsafe, overly prescriptive, and lacked a foundation of public trust and confidence. So a wide range of issues that uh, we raised. We had particular concerns about the idea of having a single centralized national identity register for the identity details of the entire UK adult population and uh, any other residents in the country. So about 60 million uh, people. We suggested that having all the data stored in a single central location would introduce risks that perhaps we might not wish to do so. The government said, but don't be stupid. This approach of a centralized system is common sense. For example, a bank or supermarket does not leave small amounts of cash in its tills overnight. It transfers this cash to a safe, highly secure central environment. This is more cost effective than making every individual till as secure and as safe as the safe. And there's sort of a logic having a single central safe security uh, environment does give you opportunities for really scaling up the security of those systems. And of course, the US government is very familiar with this approach as well. <laughs> Office of Personnel Management, which is the US government's database of uh, anybody who wants to work for government, had two cybersecurity attacks in 2015. This includes people who are applying for security vetting. Uh, etc., etc. So 21 million social security numbers were taken from this centralized single secure database. 19 million individuals who'd applied for a background investigation, so 19 million people who'd applied to work for government, and 1.8 million non applicants. So if I were to apply for a job and mentioned family and friends, some of their details would also be in the system. Included in the uh, data breach was 5.6 million fingerprints. So keeping everything together secure, not necessarily a great idea. But it's not just the Americans who've had these problems. <coughs> the South Koreans have also had a significant data breach, and the South Korean ID system essentially has to be rebuilt from scratch at the cost of millions because their database was also breached and previously their credit card databases had also been breached. So there is a question around uh, collecting and centralizing. There are practical questions around the creation of audit trails. This is a report about the proposals for the new identity card being introduced in China. Not only record the typical biographical details, name, address, etc., also will hold their credit records, a record of which hotels they've stayed in, which flights and train journeys they've taken, as well as social security information. And this is not scaremongering, this is the 21 clauses of guidelines strengthening the public security system issued by the Chinese government 13th of April 2015. So if you don't want centralized systems, if you have these concerns about the role of state surveillance, then you'd start to think about alternatives. And in the UK, in the 2010 general election, ended up with a coalition government between the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats, both of whom had taken a very strong view against the national identity scheme, the centralized database register, etc. And so after the new coalition government was introduced, uh, the first piece of legislation that was introduced was a bill to scrap the previous system, and the only way that they could reassure themselves that the data that had previously been collected, a fantastic 13,000 people had been enrolled, because it took a bit more time to get this up and running than perhaps they had expected, was to physically grind the hard disks in an industrial crusher. Because the let's wipe out all of the data could not be guaranteed to be secure to the level of assurance that the security services uh, would have required. So 
If we're not going to have a centralized system based on a national ID number or national nationally issued ID cards, <coughs> you want to move to an alternative model. And the technological way to do that is typically to move towards a more federated system. Uh, one example of a federated system is the Austrian model, which takes a very interesting view. So there is a centralized identification number for all citizens. But for each sector, for each different government department, each different government agency, you get a one-way encrypted, one-way hashed version of that identification number for each different government department. So that you don't have the ability to look up all of the different activities that a particular individual has across all of the different government agencies. If there is a need for an investigation, then it's possible to go to a court and get a judge to essentially process through and say, for this individual with this standard central number, can you then calculate the equivalent <laughs> numbers for each of the different government departments so that we can, with due uh, process, get access to all of the related uh, different uh, activities. So that's one particular uh, approach. The UK model that's been developed goes one step further. It doesn't have an ID card. It doesn't have a single ID uh, number for individuals. But it does have a very clear answer to a single question, which is, can we be confident to a level of assurance that's required for accessing government services to, secure, to, to be sure that the person who's trying to access these government services online is who they claim to be. So it's not trying to worry about entitlement, it's simply trying to answer questions uh, about access to government services. And the government verify service <coughs> is the system that's been set up uh, to do that. The approach is one based on federated identities. So there isn't a single centralized, you have a very federated uh, set, set of approaches. It explicitly only uses private sector identity providers. And the question that was asked yesterday about the public-private partnership ties in very closely uh, into this. This is a direct consequence of the government saying, we will not do centralized IDs, therefore we cannot be an identity provider. And that's an explicit contrast to the US NSTIC approach, where there is still talk about the government possibly being one of the identity providers. We are not looking in the Verify system for a gold standard, absolutely perfect, guaranteed to the nth degree that this is someone exactly and guaranteed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Rather, the government says we have. Level of, levels of assurance that we need for accessing, accessing government services. And for the time being, for the kinds of government services that we're talking about, we are only interested in level of assurance too, which is reasonably checked both that the documents or the evidence is reasonably valid and that there is a, an, a document history for those particular uh, approaches. And both the architecture and the way that the system is, is run has a very strong privacy focus. So we've, got, we've moved from surveillance by design to an approach of privacy by design. So the current identity providers that you can sign up with include Experian, Verizon, DigiIdentity, and the UK Post Office. And there are plans. The contracts have been issued, so they're in the onboarding process at the moment, for five more organizations to be able to verify IDs uh, by April of next year. Because this is designed around privacy principles, you don't just have to have a single identity provider. If you make talks like this, you'd explicitly go along as I've done and get IDs from as many identity providers as you can because that's perfectly entitled. The system is designed to allow that. That if you want to separate out the different parts of your life, you might use Experian to access your tax records, Verizon to access your driving license records, DigiIdentity to access other records, etc. 
The system, the architecture is also set up so that the identity providers do not know which government department's record you're accessing. It's done through a centralized hub and you have a two-stage process. You verify with an identity provider and they pass on data to the hub that then gets passed to the particular government service provider. So there's no linkage between the two other than through the hub and there are strict technical controls about what data is stored and how long that data uh, is stored uh, for. The scheme is set up with a set of privacy principles and I'm the <coughs> co-chair of the Privacy and Consumer Advisory Group that developed this set of principles for how the scheme is going to work, that that drives the, uh, the uh, contracting process with the identity providers, government departments who wish to get to use Verify, because the intention is that this is a Verify once, used many times across all government departments, have to buy into these privacy principles. This version of the privacy principles is explicitly written in the first person because it's all about what the citizen needs, not what the state needs. And I can come and respond to particular elements of that uh, if people have particular questions on that. But the, the approach also uh, supports and enables and encourages digital innovation. So this is only for accessing online government services at the moment. But, for example, the identity providers are introducing innovative ways of thinking about what data sources they might be able to use to verify your identity that first time. So, one of the identity providers has recently introduced an app-based capability whereby they, if you take a photo of your documents, your passport or your driving license and do a selfie, with some movement to make sure it's a live photo, they can use that to check against the passport details and to see whether or not you are the person who is the rightful holder of that. So that innovation is being offered by the identity provider against these standards for identity verification. There's similarly opportunities for innovation around secure authentication. So with people increasingly having smartphones with fingerprint readers, that do the fingerprint check against the device, once you have a verified ID, once the identity provider can be confident that that is your device and not a device that you uh, signed up, that you found in the street, why not do a fingerprint verification against your smartphone rather than receiving an out-of-band SMS message that says, are you also in possession of that smartphone? So it gives opportunities for innovation around that. And it also gives the opportunity for innovation around consumer rights and support. So one of the principles that we have is that there, if there is a dispute, if there is a query, if there is an issue about the identity process, we have set in place an ombudsman service that will give you a right to have someone to go to to say, I can't access these services, can you help me sort it out? So again, putting the citizen, the consumer at the center of the process. So I've gone through this process very, very quickly because I'm conscious that we're running short on time, but I, I can speak for hours and answer detailed questions if people uh, have those. But I'll leave it, I think, at that point then. Edgar, thank you very much for um, bringing us to the question of privacy uh, as, as the final um, presentation. So we've really gone the whole way from explicit, complete openness, as in the Icelandic situation, to this real concern about privacy and um, sort of citizen control, if you like, in, in the UK model and with, with other examples in between. We are running very short of time, uh, but I think what I'll do is just have if people have burning questions, let's just have five minutes for questions and we'll have a somewhat compressed coffee break. So there are colleagues with mics wandering around. So if you want to ask a question or make a comment, please raise your hand. Uh, one down here and introduce yourself very briefly, just so we know who you are. 
your identity, in other words. <laughs> uh, my name is Bronwyn Manby. I'm in the programme. Um, a question around the Artar card and its interaction with the National Population Registry. Um, and in particular, in the, ha, is there any plan in this legislation which is being retroactively applied to, to deal with that relationship and whether your registration... I mean, I think it's very interesting that ARDA has nothing to do with your Indian citizenship, but is there any idea that use of an ARDA card over time, for example, might indicate that, for example, you're entitled to naturalise as Indian if your citizenship was previously in doubt, the inter interrelationship between the two forms of registration and how they might work. And for those people whose Indian citizenship is in doubt, is it possible that Artar registration would in time be used as usable as evidence to indicate that you are in fact Indian or, or have the right to become Indian? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take a couple of questions in the interest of time. So if you would just make a note. Uh, yeah. So you remember the question, and then you can answer. Any other questions? Yes, we have one down here. Oh, uh, actually, can, can you bring the mic down here? Right, sorry. Um. This question will be for Robert Palacios. Uh, this is Joseph Attic with the Identity Council. Um, Robert raised a very, very important question, which has to do with the fact that um, there's a a big problem related to the voter registration basically squeezing out national identity systems. And this is a problem that's been going on for a long, long time without any solution in sight. As, as, as you know, in our work in Africa and the stuff that ID for Africa is trying to do is trying to find a solution for this. And the issue comes down to an institutional arrangement, which is the politicians are basically saying, we cannot trust an institution that is giving identity if it's under the control of the government. The independence in the identity is something that's very, very important. So how do you see, um, whether it's the World Bank or the international development community, helping us move away from this uh, to, to, so when, when the issue is not technical, when the issue is not, it all has to do with this institutional arrangement and the politicians refusing to accept Ministry of Interior running national ID and that afterwards giving uh, ID cards for voters. We'll have one more question. Yeah, the gentleman at the back from whom the mic was rudely snatched. Thank you. Um, Justin Hughes, I'm, I'm just interested in the sort of the push and pull factors on some of the identity from sort of Robert's presentation of, of how many of the at citizen and government level as sort of two distinct entities, how many governments are sort of coming to you and asking for support in this and how many citizens actually want this um, this card and to the um, to Edgar's point I believe it was on the on the UK scheme for example um, the fact that people seem to voluntarily give up much more personal data these days through social media and things than, than they are asked to under governments. Um, is this a sort of, is this a real concern, if you like, that this data is held centrally, given that in the UK, for example, pretty much 90% of the past population has a passport which holds pretty much exactly the same data? Is this a sort of, I suppose, a real or an imagined fear that people have that much concern about data being held centrally when we'll, we'll give it to Apple and Google very happily? Thank you. Great questions. Okay, let's start. Ajay. Yeah. Uh, the concern that uh, the, uh, somebody gets Aadhaar <coughs> and then eventually that might be used again, uh, for as an evidence to become citizen, uh, these concerns have been expressed by people and that is also one of the reasons why Aadhaar was being opposed in, our, in, in India. And this is one of the points in the court also that uh, right now we are not uh, going through a very rigorous process of verification of uh, a resident status as such, whether it's resident or not. Uh, uh, to that question, I can only say that uh, what the government plans to do is that uh, uh, this uh, Aadhaar is a superset. And then uh, they will have an exercise, they will conduct an exercise through which they will determine the citizenship. As on today, what the process that they have kept in uh, in place is that uh, they ha they have a process of uh, public notification. Let's say uh, if uh, somebody uh, in a village, uh, it has a list of uh, 1,000 other holders, right? That the whole uh, list will be displayed uh, publicly 
saying that you know okay, these are the people who are residents have been determined as a resident uh, as per the uh, whole Aadhaar process and then people would be able to uh, question that saying you look this person even though he is a resident residing here but he's not a citizen he came recently from let's say some border areas or somewhere and therefore his citizenship is in doubt so in such cases wherever certain objections come uh, in those cases in those cases certain process will be followed to determine whether those objections are valid or whether the citizenship could be given so that is how the whole process is going to be robert uh, yes so thank you for the question um so i think um one of the reasons I really have always admire, uh, admired Adar was because it, it's, it, it's performing of its own core function, which is identification and nothing else. And I think if we think about electoral uh, organizations, this is a very specialized uh, function, uh, identification, and mixing it with other functions in, in the election process is probably not the most efficient way to run things. That's more from an efficiency point of view. But in terms of the, the question about the, the independence, I think that's where it really lies because we, we, could, we all know that it could be done technically uh, without using a specific uh, voter ID that's separate from the national ID. So I think here the, the Peruvian case is probably the most interesting to me where you strip out the pure identification uh, function from the electoral you separate that and you leave the other functions, the administrative, the, the ter determining who's eligible for voting, that and creating the voter rolls, running the, um, you know, the, the, the election uh, posts and all of that, that can be left with the election commission and they can be independent in that sense. But if you have a, a core function of identification and importantly, you put that in an institution that is independent enough that is respected by, by all parties, that is, it is independent and autonomous, as in the case of Peru, um, then you have the, the makings of a, of a system where the independent organization can be trusted, produces good identification, and other agencies use that identification to run elections, to uh, pay social transfers, et cetera. So this is my personal opinion at this point, but I think we're going to have to think really hard about the institutional arrangement for identification in, in countries. It's evolved in different ways. As was said yesterday, I think in, in the Anglophone world, it might be in ministries of, of, of interior, where it may be in ministries of justice and, and Francophone countries. These, these are things that evolved sort of organically, but now we're at a point where we need to reconsider whether that's the best arrangement just because it happens to have been the legacy of, of, of history in, in that way. On the question of whether we're getting a lot, I think the question was, are we getting a lot of requests for um, work in this? Um, you know, we, we're pretty new to the game at, at the World Bank, I think. And we're, I still think, uh, formulating our approach. We are still doing our homework. Right now what we're doing is a lot of uh, assessments of the ID ecosystems of a country. And in some cases, that's already translating into operational uh, support for certain improvements in those identification systems. Uh, so it's a very incipient uh, stage of, 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 of our work in this. Uh, if you want to have much more experience of an institution that has actually been engaged in this, I think uh, the Inter-American Development Bank has done much more of this on a project basis over the years. We're starting in, into that now, and uh, I expect that there will be a lot of demand from two, and, and the reasons for demand from governments are, need to be you know, considered carefully. One is security, often is, is a security issue. Another is um, uh, leakages, as we say in South Asia. So uh, the, the type of billions of dollars of money that's going to people that should be getting it. Um, so there's a fiscal issue um, that, that often results in a call uh, from, from the Ministry of Finance on this. Um, and now it's gonna be, I think, refugees is gonna be the, 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 one of the biggest um, uh, demand uh, factors for, for better identification systems. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so just a, a thought on the, the voter lists issue. I mean, ultimately, this is pushing at the question of trust. Do you trust the data from the voter lists? It's possibly the institution, but effectively, it's, it's the data that's in there. And that's what becomes really fascinating about the, these interoperable systems is 
what do you trust, what do you not trust, which then raises the question of liability. If you have required that you will import the voter registration list or you use the Adhar number for uniqueness, but for not, what then happens when something goes wrong? Do you get a carte blanche approval that says, you use the Adhar number, so therefore you are fine. You have done all that you can reasonably do, or do other things come in? Because if other things come in, then you're not going to buy into those other data sets, those other data sources. Or you might use it as part of your background uh, checking. On the question about social media data, I presume you're talking about things like my MySpace account as the kind of the... Oh, sorry, that's not any... Facebook. That's precisely the point. So there is this, <laughs> there is this history of, well, what, so are we worried about Twitter? Because Twitter's declined. So yes, there is that. Uh, you should all have multiple Facebook accounts because there's no legal obligation to stop you from doing that. Facebook quite likes you to have a real names policy and it has all sorts of problems about what that actually means. The most recent one was someone who had, was showing her passport photo. My first name is Isis and therefore I should, and here's my passport, it's been issued by a trusted government body, That's not, that doesn't mean that I am an ISIS supporter. It's, it's my name, unfortunately. Um, Facebook encourages real names, <coughs> but I think that's mostly about monetizing, rather than because they have any sense of truth or integrity or whatever. And if you're talking about monetizing, then that's a whole separate discussion that can continue over coffee, I think. Does anybody have a question about Iceland? Okay, let's have the question for, for um, yeah. Can we have a mic here? I can speak up. Okay. Just a super fast comment. Um, we actually... Could you identify yourself, ma'am? Huh? Oh, Sam Dixon, World Privacy Forum. We as an organization have to deal with people who have their identities stolen from the Dev Index. And <coughs> it's, it's extraordinary uh, problem in the U.S. I would be very interested in hearing about why this is not a problem. You mean you mean theft of uh, of social security numbers from the SSDI from the Social Security Death Index? Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting that um, that in Iceland people's names are removed from the national register when they when they die, so they're not available anymore, and. I think it's, it's an, an, an issue that I, I don't know the exact answer to, but I can only speculate that, that uh, the same safeguards about uh, residence registration make it difficult for people to, uh, to, to, to actually execute a, a theft against somebody's, somebody who's dead. And um, also, if you try to take out a mortgage in the name of somebody who is, is deceased and you go into the National Register and you look for their name, you won't find it. So I suspect that in cases where there would be a potential for, for real damage to somebody, that, uh, that that avenue of security stops it from actually happening. Because people, since the whole database is open, people go in and look for people's names all the time. There might be a very, very, very brief window of time after somebody dies when you might be able to fool somebody and when the address and so forth might still be in there. The, the inclusion of the birth date in the Kenitala is also something which provides a very crude level of security. So if it's somebody who's 80 years old and you show up and you don't look 80 years old, then that's going to raise, raise people's, get and, people's and, attention. And that emphasizes the importance of digitizing, checking officially, but in practice digitizing rather than searching by first name for birth records or whatever. So the ability to check. So in the UK, one of the fraud checks that you do before your ID is verified, A, do we have some evidence that you were born? And do we also have evidence that you've not died? I mean, it's the classic day of the jackal fraud, uh, which now with a fully digitized archive of all death records going back sufficient hundreds, say, years in the UK. That's one of the flags that you do to check whether or not the ID has been done. But that clearly is a UK-based one where you've got that digital data, or in Iceland where you've got a very small population and yeah. the, the, the 
the guarantee that you've got that that data is pretty accurate yes, is, exactly. is going to be yeah. a, a, a very different kind of problem. Yeah. So thank you to very much to our wonderful panel. Thank you to all of you. And we'll come back at 25 past 11. So 10 minutes, quick coffee break, and we'll be back. Thank you. <coughs>